couple of months ago, I was clearing out stuff from my basement and came across a box that had not been opened since it was packed in 2006 when my kids and I moved. And uh, got through that strapping tape and opened it up, and it was a box of my prayer journals. They dated back to 2001. 2001 was the, the first year that Companions in Christ was ever offered, and we offered it here at this church, and I was a co-leader and a participant, and it got me started with this idea of a prayer journal. It's not really a diary, but it really does document your life and what's going on in it. So if you, if you have any kind of a journal, you, if you keep one, you know that it's kind of fun, actually, to go back in time and look and pull them out and just turn to any page and see what was going on in your life at that time, what seemed to be the most important thing, what seemed to be so critical, and then you look at your life and how it's come along. So I did that. I was pulling out some of these, and then I got to 2004. There were actually two journals marked 2004 that covered that year, and pfft, I didn't even want to touch them. Didn't even want to touch them. From the perspective of 2011, I would say 2004 for me was a time of great transition. But if you asked me about 2004, closer to 2004, I would have told you it was the most difficult and painful year of my life. In May of 2004, my husband of 20 years came to me and said that our life together was not what he wanted anymore, and he had a plan. He was going to stay in our house from May until September, at which time he was going to move out. And I said, what? This took me totally by surprise. And if you have not been through this, I know what you're thinking. What were you, asleep at the wheel? No, I was not. These things really do happen. But he said he was going to be there for a period of a few months. So I said to him, will you go to counseling with me? And he said he would. And I thought, we're good. We're going to be fine. God would never want this separation to happen. So I figured we'd go to counseling and I'd pray like crazy and everything would turn out fine. And because of that, because I was convinced the separation wouldn't happen, I told no one what was going on in my life. I didn't tell my friends in the neighborhood. I didn't tell my friends at church. I didn't tell my parents. Because when this all worked itself out, I didn't want anyone to have a lesser opinion of my marriage or my husband. So this very difficult, painful summer went along, and we went to counseling, and I prayed like crazy, and September came, and the father of my children went out and bought packing boxes. So it was time to say something to the kids. The first week of September, we told the kids. At that point, there was no reason not to tell other people. Two other things were happening in September of 2004 that started that first week. One was the third Companions in Christ class that I co-led. That started. And I also started my first class in seminary. So Companions in Christ meets two hours once a week. Came for the first week, it was about 12 people, a couple, I, I kind of knew them, uh, most of them I might have known this, their names, and a couple of them were complete strangers. And so gradually you get to know each other over the weeks. We were in our third week of Companions in Christ, and the assignment was over the week to have thought about your faith journey from the time you were really young. And then we'd get together and we'd share. What was your faith journey from, from as far back as you can remember? So when it was my turn to share, I talked about the little bit that I could remember from my childhood and coming along and things here at this church and, and that I was in my first seminary class at Eden. And I'm telling you what, I was withholding and I felt like such a fraud. I thought to myself, what would these people think if they knew what was really going on in my life? Who was I to lead any kind of spiritual formation class in a church? Who was I to take a class at seminary and even consider, even consider a vocation in ministry? What a hypocrite. What would they think if they knew? 
So I talked about this first seminary class, and somebody in the class said something about what a challenge it can be to go back to school as an adult. And someone else said, she'll be fine. She has a husband to help her with the kids. And I heard myself say to this room of virtual strangers, actually, I don't. And the story just poured out of me. I had no idea how badly I needed to tell that story. I went through the whole thing. And at the end, I was weeping. And I was trying to clean myself up a little bit. And it was silence at the table for a moment. And then someone at the table said, I haven't been a member at this church for very long. So really, nobody knows this about me, but I've been through a divorce. And she went on to talk about her personal experience with that. And then another person said, I haven't been divorced myself, but a grown child of mine just went through a divorce, and I understand how painful and awful it is, and nobody thinks less of you for what you're going through. And then someone else said, I've never shared this in this church, but I'm divorced as well. And then another we're fairly new to this church, and I haven't shared this with anybody here, but I've been divorced more than once. And then there were tears on the other side of the table where another person said, that's me as well, and I've never shared this with anybody in this church. Wow. The compassion at that table was amazing. What was done for me in that moment was incredible. Real compassion is personal and vulnerable and takes a great amount of courage. And in that moment, I received it all. And I knew, I knew that I could be transparent and I would not be rejected. I knew that I was back in community, finally. And I knew that my healing had begun. Thanks be to God. After a while, though, I, from a distance, I could look back on what happened in that class setting and realize there was even more that took place. Because the people who shared their divorce experiences hadn't shared those before in a group like that. And people who had no experience with divorce, who maybe had opinions about it, surely they learned something. Everyone in that room somehow was transformed by what took place with that very courageous compassion that was shown. And I wonder if any of you who have been through times of loss or illness, pain, need, have experienced that kind of compassion. Now, when we're in trouble and we have the courage to reach out for help, there are always people who, God bless them, there are always people who really just want to fix it for us, you know? They really just want to fix it, and you want to say to them, if it was fixable, I'd have done it already. But on occasion, you run into someone who truly, somehow, makes a real human connection with you, and sometimes you don't even know what it is exactly that they did or said or what. But after you've been with them, you feel different. You feel a little better. And you realize that maybe in time, you will fully heal from this pain. And that maybe in time, it really all will be OK. That kind of compassion is pretty rare. The thing is, most of us, seriously, when we know that somebody is in trouble, they're hurting, they're sick, they're in need, we would like nothing better than really, truly to fix it for them and to do it from, if we could do it from a distance, that would really be helpful because when we start to get close to the pain and the anguish and the need, we start to feel vulnerable and we don't like that. We really want to be in control. We really want to be in control. You know, if somebody would just put together a set of rules a step-by-step -step guide of how to help people in need from a distance that could just fix everything and just make God happy. Wouldn't that be great? 
And the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians that we heard part of this morning, was a real rule follower for a long, long time before his come to Jesus meeting. And he talks about that in this. He says, I tried keeping the rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. And Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself with him completely. And he says, my ego is no longer central. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important to Paul to make a good impression on you or even to impress God because Christ lives in him. And what he's talking about is all his life he was very ego-centered. And then everything changed and he became Christ-centered. And when he did, the rules stopped being so important and he just followed the will of Christ. And Paul made himself very vulnerable the rest of his life. And it didn't really matter what anybody else thought because Christ lived within him. See, the thing is, as Christians, we are meant to become more Christ-like all the time, and that means being Christ-centered. But the frustrating thing is that God didn't make us that way. God could have made this easier, but God didn't. And we are very ego-centered. That's just natural. It's not evil. It's just natural. We're ego-centered. And most of us have to, on a daily basis, make a real concerted, intentional effort to put Christ first. It's like our egos just have this magnetic pull to center. And we can put Christ in the center and we look away for a moment and whoop, there's our ego just pushing Christ right out of the way. We have to pay so much attention. Christ is the one who's going to be able to help us to be more compassionate. And in our scripture, in our gospel lesson, Jesus is actually giving us a great demonstration of what compassion is. In the gospel lesson, right before this reading, Jesus has just found out that his dear friend and cousin, John the Baptist, has been killed. And he is grieving, and he is exhausted, and he goes out in a boat to be by himself. You know, we do. We tend to separate ourselves when we are in crisis. When we, and there, to be alone for a while is a good thing, but if we overdo it, it's not. Well, folks knew that he had to come back at some point. So they started gathering on the shore. They wanted him to come back and start doing his healing thing. So Jesus does start to come back. And you know from a distance, you know he saw that crowd on the shore. And you know that he was still experiencing grief. And you know that he was exhausted. And don't you wonder why he just didn't like shoot him a blessing over the water and onto the land? Just say... Dear Father, please, just for anybody who needs healing, body, mind, or spirit, just do, you know? Because I'm turning my boat around, and I'm going back out to sea. But he doesn't. What the scripture says is he had compassion on them and healed their sick. For some reason, it was important, no matter how tired and no matter what kind of a state of mind he was in, it was important for him to go to shore, get out of his boat, and wade right into all that humanity. There was something about making a real connection that has to do with compassion. Jesus had compassion on them and healed their sick. Another thing that we need to keep in mind from Jesus' time, when people were unwell, body, mind, or spirit, they were considered unclean. And in Jesus' time, if you were considered unclean, you were physically separated from community physically separated from family. Now in 2011, it's hard enough to live without family and community. In Jesus' time, it was like a death sentence. Without family and community, it was tough to simply survive. So see, the healing that Jesus did, it was great that he healed people, but the, the best part of it was this. The best part of it was that it reconnected people with their families. It reconnected people with their community, which you have to have to be well in the first place. It allowed people to go home. Jesus' healing allowed people to go home, and that was the greatest healing of all. Okay, 
So Jesus is out healing people. And the day goes on, and the disciples get hungry. And they come up to Jesus and they say, we are out in the middle of nowhere, and you really need to let these people go into town and get something to eat. And you know what Jesus says? Oof. They don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. <laughs> you know, the disciples are thinking, ah, he's been out in the hot sun too long. Because you know what resources they have. They have five loaves of bread and two fish, and they're looking at more than 5,000 people. And let's admit it, as the church, don't we sometimes feel that way? When we look at the need in our community, when we look at the need in the greater St. Louis area, when we look at the need in our state, I mean Joplin alone, the need in Joplin will go on for years and years and years. And then you take it beyond our state to our country, and then if you have the nerve, you take it out to the world, and oh my goodness, don't you feel like one of the disciples standing there with five little loaves of bread and two scrawny fish and 5,000 people to feed. It's impossible. It cannot be done. And you know what? The disciples couldn't do it. What did they have to do? They had to give the bread and the fish to Jesus, who took the bread and the fish, and he gave thanks. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples who then what? Distributed God's blessing. That is who we are supposed to be, distributors of God's blessing. And when we think about our Sneaker Sunday and Sneakers with Soul, the Christ-centered compassion of all of this begins with bringing sneakers, but it is completed this coming Saturday. And we talked about this during the announcement. When you are all invited to Kingdom House, we are going to deliver sneakers, and we're going to put sneakers on those kids' feet. And three other United Methodist churches in the area are also going to meet us there, and they're going to bring school supplies. And we are going to meet these kids, and we're going to meet their families. We're going to meet folks from other churches. There's going to be a barbecue. We're going to have dinner together. And following that, we're going to have worship together. We're coming together in community in the way God intended. And everyone will be touched by that. The givers become the receivers. The receivers become the givers. And the real power of compassion in all of this is that all our lives will be transformed. But you have to wade in to humanity. You have to be there for that to happen. With Christ, all things are possible. And in our gospel lesson, where it talks about Jesus taking the loaves and giving thanks and breaking them and giving them to his disciples, it's reminiscent of the last Passover meal Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room, where out of great compassion, Jesus gave us a way to remember him always. Always. 